From the ink-stained pages of a 19th century fable recounting the mystical adventures of a mischievous puppet, the fantasy novel of Pinocchio and its characters are reimagined in a grim new light in Lies of P. Though deeply inspired by the Italian serial novel, Lies of P is quick to distance itself from the whimsical realm of childish fancy. We're instead presented a dark world on the brink of collapse, married well to atmospheric aspects of the Belle Epoque and Second Industrial Revolution of Europe, where science, technology, and hope reigned to create a unique, solemn, and compelling setting. Krat, the illustrious capital of innovation and ingenuity, an invention of puppet animatronics has plummeted from its golden splendor. A virulent unknown plague sweeps through the citizenry whereby thousands are killed or worse. Meanwhile, a robotic frenzy consumes the once docile puppets who have since broken from the covenant that binds their programming, turned on their masters, and inundated Krat's cobbled streets in blood and slaughter. This is the story of Lies of P, a tale of harrowing adventure, of investigation and discovery, as a rare, powerful, and exceedingly lifelike puppet endeavors this now dangerous, ruined city. Around this tale's heart swirl mature and profoundly existential questions on the nature of humanity, the subjectivity of truth, and the limits of reason. Let's dive in. P awakens aboard a train compartment within Krat Central Station by the distant, melodious voice of a woman unknown named simply Sophia and the faint glow of a blue butterfly. Consciousness brings with it acknowledgement, if not entirely understanding. P is a puppet, a mechanical construct, one of an overwhelming multitude that have been created in the city of Krat since their invention and have elevated it to conspicuous heights. But P is unlike any before him. Human in appearance, unbound by the Grand Covenant, coding that restricts other puppets, and possessed of the ability to lie, grow, and develop, P is an altogether unique and inimitable creation. The first chapter of his story concurrently unfolds with the city's final. Once a beacon of wealth and progress delivered by the hands of factions such as the Alchemists, the Workers' Union, and legendary genius Giuseppe Geppetto, the gilt veneer has tarnished. Krat now shudders in its death throes. It's a city on the brink of desolation. Coinciding with the pomp and flair of the anticipated grand exhibition, where all manner of technology and science were to be displayed, Krat was internally rent by mysterious and mortal occurrences. Puppets, who had for years subserviently labored under their owners, are gripped by a strange aberration in their circuitry, the puppet frenzy unknown in origin, severs the strings that bind them to the Grand Covenant's laws. Thereafter, they turn violently on the population in crazed bloodletting. Meanwhile, those refugees who survive are struck by a widespread outbreak of the virulent petrification disease, a mysterious contagion that works slowly on its victim. Organs fail, their body stiffens, and their mind shatters. Amidst quarantine zones, fire and panic, prospects of death as an escape from Krat's torment, are hopelessly dashed as the dead themselves rise, grotesque carcass monsters animated by macabre forces. This is Krat's grim reality and the harrowing environs thrust upon P as he awakens. Danger must be endured to uncover the truth of all three of the city's ailments. But Krat was not always abandoned to a deplorable hopeless fate. Its history an important foundation that must be laid before peace can continue. Once an unassuming and poor fishing village, Krat subsisted on meager trade from its harbor port. For long it endured, but then roughly 30 years before the current day, fortune cast its brilliant rays upon the city. Krat is built atop a massive vein of ergo crystal. Ergo is the essence of life. It's an ethereal manifestation of the soul, of memory, time, desire. This naturally occurring essence dissipates into the atmosphere upon an individual's passing. But when in the presence of a mineral known as crowd, ergo is absorbed and trapped, converted into a tangible and crystalline substance. Ergo crystal was first discovered beneath Krat centuries ago. 
of which the relic of Trismegistus, a subterranean network of caverns, is dedicated. The item description of Ergo Crystals and Fragments tell us that it is a mysterious power stone that can be found in Krat. Ergo is both a power source and a currency. Ergo Crystals are considered a precious material. It wasn't, however, until the arrival of a cabal called the Alchemists that this true potential was realized. The Alchemists are a band of secret cultists obsessed with the accumulation of knowledge and power in an effort to progress scientific advancement to the point of human evolution. The Arm of God recollection gives us insight into the beliefs of these fanatics. The Alchemists believe that there was once a god who was ripped to shreds trying to give a mortal life to the humans he so loved, and they wanted to revive him. All their endeavors can be traced to this prime desire. The alchemists take as their sign the Ouroboros, the mythical snake that devours its own tail, and a symbol of transformation, of space and time, and of the immortality they crave. It's interesting to note that the Ouroboros was used as a symbol of alchemy in our own history. To the alchemists, ergo was power. It was the source from which they could realize the elusive and much sought dream of eternal life. With ergo, with life itself as fuel for their transmutations and alchemical reactions, these scientists and visionaries might transcend humanity entirely and achieve the divine. A tantalizing prospect that couldn't go ignored. From death, life. The alchemists descended upon Krat and established a secret camp on an unmarked isle off the coast where they could observe and experiment unnoticed. They worked over years through subterfuge, diplomacy, direct and indirect measures to control the city, to mine the ergo veins and conduct their illicit, inhuman trials under shrouds of mystery. The alchemist Giuseppe Geppetto, an ambitious man with a brilliant mind, deduced a breakthrough that both shifted the alchemist's understanding of ergo and forever altered Krat's fate. This breakthrough was the invention of the puppet, a humanoid simulacrum of exceeding mechanical fidelity powered and sustained by ergo crystal, a machine that represented the future where man and metal would progress symbiotically to a shared, improved world. It signified a new age. Thus, the first puppet was created, and to Geppetto went the moniker Father of Puppets. What was for centuries seen as a useless substance, overnight became the city's most prized commodity. The technological possibility now unlocked through Ergo ushered in an era of prosperity and hope. Krat, the quaint but unremarkable seaside village, became the epicenter of progress, the haven for genius, the most advanced city on the earth, thanks to the industrious work of Giuseppe Geppetto. In the ensuing decades, puppets and puppet technology boomed. Citizens turned to leisure as automata replaced and executed mundane tasks from laborers to butlers and housemaids, and the alchemists slowly gathered more influence, keeping the public benighted to their true purposes as experimentation continued on their aisle to harness ergo for human, not merely mechanical, iteration. The extent of their control is referenced in Vanini's Krat Landmark Guide. The union of Krat's old families and the organization of alchemists is shown in symbolic form, given that the sacred Ouroboros mark is engraved on City Hall as well, it's obvious who owns the city of Krat. Alchemist agents enter all levels of society. Their leaders intermarry with Krat's aristocracy, and over the years their conceit is displayed with increasing ostentation as they become the city's de facto rulers. Any doubt of their authority, crushed beneath the imposing statue of Valentinus Monad, the alchemist's master. Around this time, Geppetto helps found the workshop, a guild of skilled artisans and craftsmen dedicated to puppetry and enters into contract with the venture capitalist, manufacturer, and engineering genius Lorenzini Vanini to establish puppet factories throughout the city, which in turn increased production astronomically. Each puppet 
has etched indelibly into its wiring the Grand Covenant, an invention of Vanini's that prohibits puppet autonomy and guides their actions. These four laws maintain unquestioned servitude, and they are as follows. The Grand Covenant is a set of absolute commands imprinted on puppets when they are made. First law, all puppets must obey their creator's commands. Second law, a puppet may not harm humans. Third law, a puppet protects and serves humans and the city of Krat. Fourth law, a puppet cannot lie. With these explicit strictures, humanity is safeguarded and Krat soars to glory on the back of mechanical fabrication. But paradise cannot be attained without sacrifice, and nothing is without its price. Krat's mercurial rise precipitates a terrible disease, a sickness of body, mind, and soul that the alchemists discover plaguing miners who extract ergo crystal. This must be your first time in the petrification disease quarantine zone. For most people, this is their last stop. The petrification disease, also known as the stone disease, works to immobilize an individual. Their blood turns cold and pale, their muscles cease to function, skin scales over and organs fail as those infected become trapped within themselves, deteriorating bodily prisons. The petrification disease represents terrible death. Its cause is found to be overexposure to the unstable radiation emitted from ergo. For a city built upon and suffused with ergo, Krat is vulnerable to the disease's spread and has one foot already in the grave. Rather than alert authorities or the public, however, the alchemists keep their discovery secret for it's tied to the most fortuitous revelation. Individuals afflicted by the petrification disease upon their death birth an ergo that can be harvested. Rather than diffuse into the ether, their ergo condenses into a form easily extracted. The disease becomes another avenue to power, one the alchemists seek to propagate among the citizenry in clandestine ways. They flood the city with ergo, it replaces currency, fuel, and embeds itself within all aspects of life and culture, all the while supersaturating crot with radiation. Most don't bat an eye, but there are some weary of the alchemists and their new forms of ergo, as we can see in the factory manager's report found in Vanini works. It reads, As per your orders, I conducted a quality investigation on the ergo supplied by the alchemists. Of course, it was done secretly. Certainly, the quality of ergo was getting worse over time. I don't doubt the alchemists, but the decrease in quality is too widespread to call it a coincidence. At this rate, this quarter's puppets will have a high chance of defects. The most important thing is the quality of the ergo, after all. According to a reliable source, the high-level alchemists are running ergo production experiments, lately using another method. Personally, I think their secret experiments have something to do with the decrease in ergo quality. These secret experiments alluded to are centered on the petrification disease, the ergo its victims produce, and a means of neutralizing or wielding its deleterious effects through an elixir cure. The alchemists kidnap or cajole myriad test subjects on whom they perform grotesque trials. They see in the petrification disease a window, an opportunity for higher evolution if only they can create bodies strong enough to resist the plague's erosion. Distillation and permutation creates a substance that halts the progress of the disease, but generates entirely new and grave concerns. An experiment report of the order divulges the truth about alchemist practices. Three patients suffering from the petrification disease who got the elixir injection at the same time died. Right up until their deaths, they experienced painful necrosis and skin ruptures, seizures and convulsions, and crystalline metastasis throughout the body. Ultimately, they became mutations known as carcasses. In an attempt to plague God and circumvent the petrification disease, the alchemists instead create a demonic force. They release their experiments into the barren swamp, 
a quagmire of rot and scrapped puppetry, Krat's veritable graveyard. Interestingly, these carcass monsters possess an insatiable appetite for ergo, and they swiftly devour the crystal stored within puppet remains. The consumption of ergo fuels their own growth and evolution, seen in the green monster of the swamp, an account of this beast recollected in the century's notes. I don't think it's the waste problem. I've observed it. It obsessively protects its nest and likes to bring its toys there. The puppet bodies aren't used just as toys. This thing sucks ergo from scrapped puppets before playing with what's left. It feeds on ergo and that's why it grows so big. I think that green guy was made by the alchemists for sure. Or he's their mistake. The carcass monsters represent a failed experiment, but with inspiring results. They are human bodies that feed and grow from ergo. If only the monstrous side effects of the elixir could be curbed. While the alchemists continue to refine, Clark Shore, a man known as Dr. Cureall, steals into their labs and confiscates a sample of the distillate. Unaware of what it produces, Dr. Shore administers what he calls a miraculous cure for the petrification disease to hundreds of Krat's citizens, who are in a matter of weeks horribly transformed into aggressive, mindless undead. But as the alchemists control Krat's information, they work assiduously to cover up the truth and allay fears. Even so, it's not long before panic and death spread from the mines and the barren swamp into the population at large. The petrification disease manifests as a lethal plague with sporadic outbreaks. One victim, in particular, is of consequence. Giuseppe's son Carlo, whom the genius claimed to love, but whom he hardly saw, grew up with the children of Monad's charity house while his father toiled away in his workshop. Carlo desired nothing more than Giuseppe's acknowledgement, nothing more than for his father to be present. He fought Giuseppe's work for attention and affection, but the genius always remained in his shop, burning midnight oil, improving designs. Resentment filled Carlo in his youth for a father perpetually absent. Soon after the boy graduates school, disaster strikes the house of Geppetto. Carlo contracts the stone disease and dies a slow, agonizing death. One victim in an outbreak on the Rose estate the Rose Estate Incident papers hint at the boy's death and also demonstrate the great power wielded by the alchemists over Krat, as well as their desire to keep the disease far from common knowledge. The city of Krat decided to put an indefinite stop to the investigation on the disaster that took place in the Monad Charity House, known as the Rose Estate. This was to prevent chaos caused by the large-scale spreading of the petrification disease. There have been no confirmed survivors so far. The Charity House, once a boarding school for kids from the slums, has until recently been home to the founding Monad family, many students and refugees. The leader of the alchemists, Valentinus Monad, has been confirmed to have passed during this catastrophe, and this will take a toll on the alchemists. Grief, but also guilt, filled Giuseppe's heart as he realizes too late how little he'd spent with his son. Every should have and could have follow Carlo to the grave, and Giuseppe is left in hollow, bereft anguish for his failing. His mind refuses to admit fault, and instead blame for his son's death is cast with the alchemists, with whom Geppetto now severs ties completely. For long he sulks, but Geppetto's pitiable state is ameliorated with interesting news. It's because we don't truly understand ergo, at least that's my view. Sometimes ergo-driven puppets gain what we call awakened egos. Individuality, more or less. Which is a dangerous thing if someone's not ready to handle it. Though that is rare, or used to be. Puppets throughout Krat have been acting strange, recalling memories of the dead in demonstrating personality. What was thought as an artifact in puppet coding is discovered to be the awakening of the ergo housed within each puppet's machinery. As discussed, 
Ergo is the essence of mind and soul. Automata, fueled by the spirits of the dead, have miraculously awakened those spirits. The revitalization of Ergo coincides with puppets developing an ego, a personality, or perhaps even nascent humanity as they rediscover their lost selves. In this development, Geppetto sees an opportunity to reunite with Carlo, to revive his son from beyond the grave as a puppet. But for this, no mere puppet will do. His son is special to him, and so must be his son's new body. He immediately sets to task developing the most advanced, most lifelike puppet ever produced, going so far as to incorporate Carlo's physical corpse into the design. For those who endure such suffering, the line separating ethical from unethical becomes exceedingly blurred. Geppetto reiterates earlier technology on the ergo crystal cores that fuel current puppet models to produce a novel, powerful core named the P-organ that houses Carlo's ergo and functions as a fuel source for the puppet, its symbolic heart and soul. Unfortunately, initial drafts show that the puppet's ergo efficiency is horribly destructive and risks fracturing the boy's delicate ergo. To strengthen it against the puppet's destructive potential, the P-organ needs to absorb an immensity of ergo. To this end, Geppetto sets in motion two plots that plunge Crot, already buckling from outbreaks of disease and the first reports of carcass sightings, into madness. The Grand Exhibition, a show of science and the future due to take place in the city, attracts eyes the world over, an ostentatious display of Crot's marvel. It's here that the alchemists Lorenzini Venini and Giuseppe Geppetto all intend to reveal their hand. The alchemists, under new leadership of Simon Manus, seek to showcase the final step in human evolution. Their experiments bear fruit, and through various elixirs they've produced superhuman, unconstrained even by death, in Victor, the champion. He has survived the horrible mutations, risen above the carcass, but retains their insatiable hunger for ergo. Lorenzini, for his part, wishes only to remain the Prince of Crot and dominate the spotlight with garish displays of new puppet technology. While Vanini's attention is drawn to increased production, Geppetto circumvents the Grand Covenant's programming and rewrites the laws to include a perfidious Law Zero. The laws of the Grand Covenant bind us. We're his puppets. First law, all puppets must obey their creator's commands. Law Zero. The creator's name is... Geppetto. Giuseppe Geppetto. A stipulation that binds every puppet unquestioningly to his will. Extensions of his command for one terrible purpose. Geppetto wishes for the P-organ to absorb ergo. To expedite its harvest requires its mass liberation. In other words, massacre. Geppetto implements Rule Zero and instigates the puppet frenzy as the hour of the Grand Exhibition approaches. From every quarter of Crot, within every home and on every street, the puppets that have by this point grown ubiquitous turn on their masters. They beat, maim, kill in an unprecedented wave of gore. Violence and fear cast shadows upon the city as thousands are slain, their ergo released for Geppetto's collection. Now, he initiates his second phase. The puppeteer works with industry to produce a puppet unbound by the Covenant, possessed of great strength and ability to absorb ergo and stabilize the P-organ, thus paving the way for Carlo's return. In his railcar workshop, Geppetto imbues life upon a creation not quite human, but neither puppet, with the visage of his lost son, charged with harnessing ergo and tempering the P-organ's frame under the altruistic guise of bringing stability to Crot and ending the bloodshed. This puppet's soul is awakened in the derelict railcar within Crot Central Station, surrounded by mystery, hysteria, and danger, not by Geppetto, but by the pleas of a distant stranger. 
Geppetto's puppet, whose true purpose is obscured from him, is caught in a web of lies and a triangle of actors, upon susceptible to the vagaries of power that shape his reality. At one point stands Simon Manus and the alchemists. Unremitting in their pursuit of divinity, the alchemists and Manus will stop at nothing to see their ambition realized. The second point of the triangle is assumed by the king of puppets and the frenzied automatons rampaging through the city streets. Ensconced in the opera house at Rosa Isabel Street, the domineering king is believed to have orchestrated the frenzy and leads his puppets in pursuit of Krat's beleaguered citizens. Geppetto hides his motives well and is beyond suspicion as true instigator of the puppet frenzy. Instead, he places the blame at the king of puppets' feet, a mysterious machine that is somehow unfettered by the Grand Covenant. But Geppetto doesn't foresee the evolution of the puppet's ergo and development of ego. It circumvents Giuseppe's Law Zero and resists his influence. The king frees other puppets from Geppetto's thrall and fights against alchemists, carcass, and petrification disease alike. Every action he takes is to thwart the final force of the triangle, Giuseppe Geppetto. Geppetto is motivated by self-resentment and self-delusion. He feels himself responsible for his son Carlo's death and knows it to be true, if not physical death, then the death of Carlo's spirit. Without affection, without attention or nourishment, Carlo withered, Geppetto too consumed by his work to realize. Atonement and acceptance are unbearable. Geppetto instead continues the deception. He wishes to undo the past, to not only revive his son Carlo, but improve upon him. Only by creating life from machine can the brilliant craftsman attain the total control he desperately desires. With the body of Carlo resurrected and bound to Geppetto's strings, he can fit perfectly the mold of the prodigal son. This is the true purpose for which P was made, a tool to temper the P organ and prepare it for transfer into Carlo's body. A means to an end is all Geppetto sees, and he burns all of Krat to realize it. Thus the foundation has been laid, the spark ignited, and the city engulfed in conflagration. Besieged by machine, malady, and madness, few of Krat's citizens remain. With dauntless conviction and an intrepid spirit, P trudges through the ruins of Krat to uncover the reality of its depravity. He's not alone in this journey. Sophia Monat, the blue butterfly, acts as guide and sanctuary for the puppet of Geppetto. The daughter of Valentinus Monat, past leader of the alchemists, Sophia is endowed with the power of a listener. I am able to wield Ergo. They call me a listener because I can hear Ergo. I inherited the power from my mother, who hated it, called it the devil's power. So I kept it a secret that I could talk to puppets. Now you are the only one my voice reaches. So I beg you, please save Krat. Listeners are possessed of an innate ability to hear Ergo to listen to the inner thoughts and desires of others, to communicate and empathize with all, including puppets, even to manipulate the fabric of time. Munad harnesses P's gathered ergo to strengthen him, and she rewinds time whenever grave danger threatens, for his mission is too important to be left to chance. Great machines, foul beasts, and terrible foes stand before him intent on destroying the puppet of Geppetto, and with him, the truth. But from lies are the greatest truths revealed. Amidst the tarnished luster, the wearing cogs of danger, P himself embarks on a journey that is twofold. The first is that of revelation. Many secrets lie buried in Krat. As P plums the cobbled streets, he is enlightened to the events surrounding his awakening, and improves in his discernment of verity from falsehood. He learns of the puppet king's real identity and purpose. Carlo's friend Romeo, from beyond the grave, resurrected to carry out a ruthless frenzy at another's behest. Romeo was Carlo's closest childhood friend. They grew, played, and dreamed together within the Monad charity house. 
Romeo too contracted the terrible petrification disease, and as it withered his body, his final wish was to be made a puppet so that his ergo could continue to fight against the disease and save the less fortunate. But as his metal body awakened, realization dawned that he was not its master, and the depths of Geppetto's treachery revealed. Romeo was to act as scapegoat, as villain and enemy to obfuscate Geppetto's own culpability in the puppet frenzy. As we hear in his ergo description, Romeo is made a prisoner. When the boy opened his eyes, he found himself sitting on a throne that he had not asked for. When he sought his friend of the past, he clung to his memories even though he knew there was no going back. The puppet speaks in a cryptic language indecipherable yet holds a message imperative to convey. A mock performance is given attempting to not only enlighten P, but warn him against the blind faith placed in his creator. Romeo's ultimate failing comes when he is unable to convince P of the truth, unable to ignite past memories and illuminate Geppetto's duplicity. Only in death is his message received as Vanini decrypts the recollection, king of puppets message. The revelation that Geppetto is at all associated with the puppet frenzy is a shock to P's internal gears. This pales in comparison to the truth of Ergo revealed by Sophia. Ergo is the essence of life made from the petrification disease. It contains the memories and distilled lifespan of the victim. That's why puppets sometimes awaken their old selves or describe someone else's memories. It's prized for what it offers, potential. It empowers the alchemists in their obsessive reach for evolution and perfection. Sophia herself is not what she before appeared, rather a specter, a figment and memory meant to guide P to her prison and the sight of Simon Manus's planned transcendence to godhood. Most shocking of all to P is his creator's betrayal of trust. Misplaced faith and devotion found its way to Geppetto, emotions that only a parent can conjure. In truth, P is nothing more than a simulacrum of Carlo, a fabrication meant to suffice Giuseppe's guilt in the interim and beckon forth his true son's resurrection. It's a perception-shattering revelation. The second journey is that of discovery. P is like no other puppet, unfettered by the Grand Covenant's strictures, possessing a visage so lifelike that it fools many, and powered by a heart that not only gathers ergo, but is itself pliable to transformation. P's is a discovery of what critically makes one human. Through various interactions, by either lying or telling the truth, by engaging with the humanities, is P's own stoked. The ergo within, begins to whisper to him. His cogs begin ticking, his pea organ warms. As he engages in activities that only humans can perform and appreciate, his reality is blurred as P erases the line that separates man from machine. This is symbolized by P's aesthetic changes. After all, change is an experience that separates human from construct, natural from artificial. P's hair first grows long to the astonishment of several, and later turns colors completely, a step away from puppetry and toward humanity. Based on his decisions made in the Crucible of Krat, P discovers that puppets and their creators are not so distinguishable as once thought, discovers the quintessence of humanity. P's reverie is short-lived, as is his opportunity to question his creator. Hotel Krat is ransacked, Geppetto kidnapped by agents of Manus, and taken to the Isle of Alchemists. With his heart fortified and his steel sharpened, P makes passage to the Isle in hopes of uncovering a kernel of authenticity amidst the lies. Manus has cloistered himself within the formidable Arch Abbey, bastion of the alchemists behind redoubtable fortress walls. It's atop the tower that Simon has constructed a massive device to siphon all of Krat's released ergo and channel it into his body, thus achieving divine immortality. 
As P ascends the Arch Abbey, he must dispatch Manus's adherents and confront Maxacia, the Complete, an alchemist injected with a refined elixir distilled from their experimentation with the petrification disease. Speed, strength, and command of the storm are conferred onto this most formidable of foes. But P remains resolute in his charge to free both Sophia and Geppetto. The former is hopelessly and horrifyingly imprisoned. Sophia, it's revealed, was subjected to gruesome testing in order for the alchemist to wield her unique gifts as a listener. Simon wished to control time and alter perception. He desired to rebuild the world, to, in his own words, establish one founded on truth and devoid of lies. If our thoughts are known to the masses, if we cannot hide motive or memory from one another, if our very souls are laid bare, the paradise Manus envisions will manifest. To this end, he harnesses the abilities of the listener. Simon drags Sophia to the hidden isle of alchemists, experiments, and injects to wrest her power from her, and binds her to a torment Sophia can't endure. The twisting of her body shatters Sophia's very essence. Unable to retain her identity against gales of energy, the girl's psyche is fractured, releasing her spirit from its chains and allowing her to project her being across space and time. It is this we see symbolized in the blue butterfly that alights and awakens P in the opening moments of the game, Sophia's desperate gambit to save Krat from Simon's machinations. Now mutated, Sophia slowly withers. Left in agony worse than death, the poor woman begs P for solace, and Geppetto's puppet is confronted with a choice. If sufficient humanity has been accrued, and if P decides to offer Sophia peace in death, rather than prolong her suffering, she imparts her own ergo. This act of mercy touches P's very heart as he undergoes another transformation, coloring his hair in a shade reminiscent of the blue butterfly. With Sophia freed from her prison, P next unbinds Geppetto, who resides in a cell at the top of Arch Abbey. With doubts and questions turning through the cogs of P's mechanical brain, the puppeteer's own mind frays at the edges. Melancholy descends as Geppetto wonders whether he has been a good father to his puppet creation. His grip on reality blurs as he tells P that soon they will be a real family, like they once were. All that remains is a final confrontation with Simon Manus. At the tower's peak, the leader of the alchemists undergoes a gruesome transcendence as he absorbs all of Krat's gathered ergo into his body. Using an artifact known as the Arm of God, Simon Manus not only touches the divine, but himself ascends to divinity as he's charged with supreme powers. But such powers defy the laws of nature. Simon stands as an abomination that must be stopped. With his ultimate defeat, the alchemists are undone, their leader dead and their order fractured. With them dies their vision of human evolution. With the arm of God in his possession, P and Geppetto reunite. But foreboding rather than warmth permeates this reunion. Giuseppe has with him a sealed, mysterious box. He tells P that the arm of God was one of the last two ingredients he required. Soon, they will be whole and happy, but not perhaps in the way the puppet might have imagined. Geppetto offers to turn his creation into a real boy as proof of fatherly love and as a gift for all P has done. All that's needed is the P organ, the boy's heart. But with this great sacrifice, the puppet's life as it has been experienced will be forfeit, his reality and his humanity ended. I just need the final ingredient. The one that holds your memories and your lifespan. Your heart. Three endings are possible to close this morbid fairy tale, depending on peace choices made throughout his adventure. Each carries with it a profound message, and all culminate in the final confrontation between Geppetto and his artificial son. 
the first attained, if P remains true to the proscriptions of the Grand Covenant, if he retains a puppet's inability to lie, inability to change. Without encountering and gathering sufficient humanity, P's hair and persona are untouched. He is a puppet loyal to his creator and fulfilled of his purpose endowed by Geppetto. The P organ within has been tempered and strengthened by Ergo. It's ready for its final home, within the amalgamation of metal and flesh that is Carlo's body. Geppetto asks P for his heart, and in return his father will transform him into a real boy, into a real human. To comply, sees the P organ forcefully ripped from his body. In P's death, Carlo is given new life. Geppetto is reunited with his son, a good boy who listens to his father and obeys. Giuseppe's megalomania and need for absolute control is made apparent when the pair return to Hotel Crot, wherein Geppetto orders Carlo to slaughter all those humans who may know of his culpability in the city's fall. Carlo appeases his father, and the people who once helped P on his journey are replaced by puppets metal effigies of their past selves, bound to absolute subservience. A twisted fate in which all live happily ever after, in the design written by the mad genius Geppetto. This finally feels like family. Thank you for returning, Carlo. The second ending presents itself as an option a choice that P must make when confronted by Geppetto. For this to occur, the puppet must have gained enough humanity, enough autonomy and agency to have a mind and will of its own. By engaging with those unique human attributes, P develops sufficiently to have pause at Geppetto's request. His freedom is his choice, and rather than make his life forfeit, P denies his creator. Geppetto then uses a marionette device whose ergo filaments control the nameless puppet, Carlo's incomplete body, to take the P-organ by force. Then I'll have to retrieve it myself. My son. The two puppets engage one another in combat, but the nameless puppet's strength and rage proves great. As it prepares the killing blow, Geppetto stands between the blade and its intended target, the P-organ that houses Carlo's memories, soul, essence. Astonished by the puppet's willingness to destroy what Geppetto sees as his son's heart, he is moved to action. But in his dying breath, he makes known his sacrifice wasn't for P's benefit. No, he curses the puppet created in memory of Carlo for his death, and for exposing his son's vulnerable heart. I... No. You're just a useless puppet. The third possible ending comes only if P gathers sufficient humanity to break loose from his puppet strings, and if he grants Sophia the peace she so desperately desired. This act of sympathy, of suffering acknowledged, proves so essentially human that P transcends his mechanical constraints and becomes something else entirely. The fight against the nameless puppet transpires in much the same fashion, but instead of Geppetto's intervention to save the P organ, and subsequent cursing of the worthless puppet, he sees P shed an actual tear, something that shouldn't be possible for a construct. Grave revelation dawns on Geppetto. His son resides not within the nameless puppet, not within the P organ, but is manifest before him entirely in the image of P. Too late he realizes the destruction and ruin he instigated is all for naught. Too late 
he realizes his son has been present in P all along. After, P performs another act profoundly human. He sacrifices his ergo to empower a puppet in the make of Sophia, imparting to her new life, a form of immortality. Though this drains him significantly, we are left with an image of a P not dead, merely unconscious, and the sun dawning on a new chapter for the city of Krat. So ends the grim fairy tale adventure of P and the lies surrounding Krat. These events evoke strong emotion and lead one to question previously held notions. What is a soul, and is death truly its end, or does one linger in whispers and memories for future generations? What is it that separates a human from a machine? Is it choice? Is it persona? The autonomy to act as one wills? The city. The alchemists, the puppets and pioneers, are all a cautionary tale to the extent of ambition, the destruction in hubris, but also on the courage to see streaks of gold beyond sheets of rain. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on the complete story of Lies of P. Let me know your thoughts on the alchemists, on Geppetto, and on which ending resonates most, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of Lauren's storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast, where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon, who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash the lorebarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the world.